writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things, stuff coming out soon, and... Um, actually, I'm hoping to have some short stories in graphic, um, not, I guess it's called graphic short story form instead of graphic mm. novel form. I'm working with a artist right now, turning two of my short stories and maybe a poem if I get him to buy into that, <laughs> um, into a not, uh, graphic form. Once that's available, it will be up on my website at www.davidallenlucas.com. I've also broken what I thought would be my promise of never blogging again. I have started blogging and about the applying the Bushido in your daily life and outside of being just a warrior. And with that, also voice actor as well as writer. With that, I am going to kick this over to, well, I guess we'll just do a summit from President of St. Louis Writers Guild to President of Missouri Writers Guild. Thank you very much. My name is George Saroy. As David said, I'm the proud president of the Missouri Writers Guild. I'm also an author of science fiction for the young adult reader with my finished works, Excelsior, and the five-part science fiction serial from Parts Unknown, both available on Amazon.com. And I am currently working on the edits for Ever Upward, part two in the Excelsior journey. And I have several audiobooks under my belt as of right now, uh, with two children's books, Rumple Pimple and The Golden Rule, as well as the uh, YA fantasy novel Argentum, Part 2 in the Pause Saga, and my own Excelsior, all finished. And you can find out more information about me on my website, he's got it.com. Also with us, I'm going to turn over to the only lady in the room, and then I'll finish off the panel after her. Um, the other ladies were not able to attend today, so you are stuck being our only female voice. I'm Melanie Lucas. Um, I am haven't been writing much this week, but uh, I am working on a fantasy novel, and I will also point out that with some debate, we all in this room are writing... Uh, young adult uh, sci-fi fantasy in this room. True. Yes. Okay, yes, I guess that based upon what I'm currently writing, I can't believe I'd be saying that I'm working, writing anything for young adult or even children, but yeah, mm-hmm. I guess really it is. Yeah. So, kick it over to, speaking of young adults... Yes, nobody? Uh, I am Brad R. Cook. I am the player with cats. Uh, so <laughs> if you hear me distracted, I am currently uh, playing with cats. Uh, but yes, I am Brad R. Cook. I am the author of the steampunk trilogy, The Iron Chronicles, which is Iron Horseman, Iron Zulu, and Iron Lotus. Uh, you can find my short stories, Doom Fly to the Majestic is the last one to come out. Uh, they are all online in various places around. Uh, so do check them all out. You can find out more at bradrcook.com. And be on the lookout, because this November, very soon, uh, you will be able to pick up my latest adventure, Steam Tree. Uh, excellent. <laughs> and actually, also joining us today is Twain, yes. the um, overseer. Yeah, Twain, one Twain of cat. my um, muse cats, if uh, you will, or bosses. If you ever follow me on Instagram you will, or Facebook, you will see pictures of when the cats are deciding that they are going to make sure that I am putting out my word count. Um, today's topic is a little bit nebulous, and it's, it's nebulous on purpose. It is philosophy and storytelling. And there's lots of approaches to this. There is the approach of argument. There's the approach of, how do I want to put this, of exploration. There is the approach of high-minded, high-browed, I am over you. So let's talk about how philosophy gets into our writing. Go for it. Well, it also throw out there is using philosophy and philosophers in your writing. So if you want to check out the Iron Lotus, there's a whole thing about Diogenes in there. 
Uh, Diogenes was the uh, inventor of cynicism, so to speak. Uh, he didn't invent it, but he did coin the term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, how does philosophy? First off, let's go. Let's go ahead and let's take a step back. Is the fact that we are writing a story of any kind a way of expressing our own personal philosophy to the world, Brad? Uh, okay, so there's a there's a lot of papers and blogs and books and stuff on this. Uh -huh. And if you talk to anybody, especially English teachers, they will undoubtedly say that we all throw our deep psychoses into <laughs> our books um, and me, all that kind of good stuff. Let me pause you. I'm gonna grab a Sigmund Freud. Um, yes. Cigar here, and uh, please tell me about why you hate your father and your mother. And now, the see, there's the perfect example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I would actually throw out that that is not necessarily always the case. Um, you mean sometimes a good cigar is just a cigar? Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes a blue room is just a blue room. Uh, yeah, no, and the reason I throw that out is it's something I often get thrown at me as like, you know, oh, do you write your father-son relationships this way because of the way you are with your father and all this kind of stuff, and it's like, no, not really, actually. I write characters based off of what I think the character is best and what's best for the story. So, yes, there probably is some deep-seated psychological stuff that Alexander goes through in my books that I totally am, like, you know, working out in, like, my novels and stuff. But the reality, I think, is is that often we're just writing characters and stories. Now, to that end, I would say that the philosophy of why we write and how we write and what we do put into our stories, obviously there are a few things that do go into that. Your passions and stuff, the things you're interested in. Obviously, we all write about science fiction because we hold a deep-seated passion for science fiction and fantasy. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things, I would say, very much play into the philosophy of why we write and how we write. Um, but... In terms of the, you know, deep-seated, psychological, Freudish, you know, kind of things, no, I, I think we're, I think we're much more evil geniuses crafting our, you know, maniacally, you know, our own universes as if we were gods, as opposed to just dumping in our own deep-seated narcosis. Well, that, that kind of plays into the old phrase of write what you know. Now... We all are writers of young adult science fiction. At the same time, though, what we write is not exactly what we have experienced. You know, like I know I've never, you know, held up a sword and and absorbed the power of a god. I know I know that much. But I also know that. Uh, but at the same time, I have, when I was a kid, spent time in a closet. You know, like you know, with uh, with a desk and everything, writing my little stories and. That is that is in my book because that is something that I know. But at the same time, what gravitates us to writing science fiction is really the best of science fiction, and those are always kind uh, kinds of commentaries on how that particular author sees the world, what the potential is for us to eventually go into that direction, and what we can do to get ourselves on a better course. I'm going in a completely different direction, so is it related at all? No, you're right. Okay. Um, I was just thinking the conventions of storytelling actually do expose the philosophy. For instance, in myths, in a lot of Greek myths, you had a fate and you couldn't defeat fate. And the point of a lot of the stories is you raged against it, but then what you did to try and fight your fate turned out to bring about whatever was fated to happen. So, and in the modern day, sometimes... Things, mores and philosophies change over time, but for a long time, in like the movies, bad guys couldn't win. Mm -hmm. Or if the bad guy won, he, well maybe he technically didn't completely lose, but he wasn't happy about it. Or maybe he had some revelation, so he wasn't really the bad guy. So it's like, yeah, evil can't triumph. That was actually one of the philosophies that was expressed in stories. I can actually uh, go you uh, one better with that. You know, like when it comes to like the Greek plays mm -hmm. that were done, back, you know, back in the day, there was that was where the phrase "Deus ex machina" yeah. came mm -hmm. in, and that came in because everyone there was basically of the mindset of God's going to sort it out, and that's what happened mm -hmm. in the plays. God would come down, He would sort things out, and everyone would go home happy. Yeah. If only we still had that to do. No, just kidding. I saw um, that really well in a book I was reading. It's like, that was the best use of Deus of Machida I've ever seen. Nice. It actually made sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
what I would throw out is that getting back to the philosophy of why we write, I think exploring man, and, okay, exploring human, I did not mean men, I meant as in humanity. So exploring humanity, I think, is something all writers do. And in that sense, that's something all philosophers do. So I think that we are treading in the same waters as Socrates and Plato. And mm -hmm. yes, I did say Socrates. <laughs> um, yes. Exactly. It's a movie thing. I highly recommend I'm you look up the most to excellent give him some, movie. Um, never mind. Yeah. I'll leave it alone. Digitalis. <laughs> but go ahead. Yes. But anyway, the point being is that, you know, the philosophers, and one of the reasons why we still study them today is because they study, you know, they study humanity as a whole and they studied us uh, in micro and macro and that's something that writers do even we as science fiction fantasy writers uh, we might talk about you know spaceships or I talk about airships but in reality that's just a set piece for a much different story that is being woven underneath that hopefully your subconscious or if you're thinking about my story more than just it's cool airships fighting in the air uh, you're gonna read in and get a little bit more out of it uh, those kinds of things, exploring, you know, if you think about it, the classic YA tale is an emergent story. It's, it's, you know, finding oneself and emerging into your life. Well, that's classic, you know, every tale that's been told throughout all of history. Um, you know, from the myths that you guys were mentioning up through to the, you know, Victorian, you know, romances and stuff like that, up through every movie that comes out today, practically. So these are things that I think are timeless that we as writers kind of jump into and explore. And I think we as storytellers, it's, you know, that's why I think it goes beyond just writing into movies and other things like that. Uh, we rely on that ability to study both the positives and negatives, the overall reaching abilities of man versus the tiny little in, you know, independent parts that make us up i.e. like every horror flick or murder mystery that's out there exploring the dark psycho side of, you know, our minds. So I think in that sense, the philosophy of, you know, and, and actually taking the actual philosophy is something that we all kind of weave through on some level, but yet a blue room is still a blue room. <laughs> <coughs> Just out of curiosity, why'd you choose blue and not red? Uh, why? Because it was nautical themed. Ah. So that's why the room is blue. <laughs> <laughs> you mean it wasn't blue because it was expressing your inner doubts? No, of... it has nothing to do with his somber mood after having just lost his father or anything like that. Nope. <laughs> what about, um... Okay, I'm going to jump into the deep water here. <clears throat> Not science fiction necessarily, though science fiction lends itself very highly to this. But let's go the jungle. The Grapes of Wrath. I know, yes, I'm using that as an example. If you know, if you've listened to these podcasts, you know Grapes of Wrath is one of my least favorite novels in the world. Um, it's stories that look at social issues. Why are those stories so powerful and changing versus being able to sit there and go, well, according to... Our statistical data, this is showing blah. Why is stories more? Well, one of my faves in this arena, uh, thank you to my English teachers, because I don't know if I would have picked up the book, or necessarily, I don't know if I would have finished the book without my English teachers, is Lord of the Flies. Mm. Um, and it is a great uh, book that breaks down the dark side of not only the male psyche, but also group mechanics and how we all function when society breaks down and we lose the undercurrent that, you know, kind of is the foundation of our world and, you know, what happens when things, you know, factions start playing in and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it really is just about a, an island full of boys who are murdering each other. That's the basis plot of the, you know, the book. But if, that, if it were just that, if it were Battle Royale... Uh, done, you know, on an island, then no one, I think, would care. And I don't think that book would have done any well or really had stayed beyond any, you know... It wouldn't have gone out... It wouldn't have made it out of the 60s, I guess. That's what I'm saying. But, because it explores this huge, dark nature of humanity, it's become a book that almost everybody reads now so that we can all have that fundamental basis of 
yeah, that's probably, you know, society's a good thing, let's not get rid of it. <laughs> let's not go back to that. Stories, basically, for, as they, when it comes to, when it comes to using, um, when it comes to using the author's, you know, sensibilities and everything, they become a cautionary tale, like all stories really are. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, that was one of the best. Lord of the Flies was definitely one of the, one of the best, you know, types of cautionary tales. It just mm -hmm. kind of goes, it, um, whenever I think about that, I think of a random lot, a great line from the first Men in Black, when Kay said, a person is smart, people are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and yep. you know it. And that is, that's a, that's a beautiful thing when it gets illustrated in a story, the way that, uh, the way that it did in Lord of the Flies. But throughout history, I think we as humans are, and this is a sociology thing, we, we evolve to tell stories and f to learn from stories and to learn, make stories out of our lives and out of things we see to transmit information. And until fairly recently, we didn't really have statistical tools. And statistics aren't real to us on an instinctive level. I mean, I believe in statistics. Statistics are more real than the stories. I mean, they give you truer answers if used correctly. But they don't feel as real and they don't feel as vivid. And a good story can convince someone to do something when the statistics tell you you should do the opposite. Yeah, but, but that is, that's one of the things that I, I've always been kind of fascinated about storytelling. Storytelling is a wonderful way to grab your attention and, and make you think without really pushing you to think, you know, like as well. You know, like if you just have someone standing there just basically just breaking down why Lord of the Flies is so amazing and so pivotal and, and, de and um, very much a cautionary tale, like I said before, that's one thing. You can very easily just kind of tune your audience out. But as soon as you tell them, I'm going to tell you a story, all of a sudden people just naturally kind of gravitate toward that storyteller and away from the person who is just preaching. And storytelling tends to elicit the empathy yeah. in, the, in a person. We get, if you've written or if you're a spoken storyteller, if you can connect any of the main characters to the audience, you've got them. You've got them listening and they can talk, they can listen to what the story is about. Go ahead. Well, and, uh, this is where uh, point of view comes into play. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, one of the reasons I bring this up, and I do a whole point of view workshop, I'll be doing one at PenCon. Uh, so if you're going to be at PenCon, stop by. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, in, when you choose a point of view, um, you have a variety of options, first, second, third, obviously, are the, the big ones. But beyond that, they get broken down beyond that. Um, first person is the most direct. You are literally acting out the story in your mind that's taking place in front of you. It's the most immediate, it's the one that's the most uh, impactful upon the reader. Uh, but And the reason I bring this up is you have third person objective, which is, for lack of a better way of putting it, watching a nature show. Which is where the narrator is essentially sitting on the couch next to you, pointing out and looking at a TV, and everything is laid out very factually. Uh, and the reason I say like a nature show is because when we watch the lion jump and destroy the gazelle, uh, it's done without any sense. There's no music that comes in, so we feel the loss of the gazelle. There's no triumph that comes in, so we, you know, cheer with the lion. You know, it's just laid out. And, and in that sense is that philosophy of storytelling of how impactful do you want to be, how much do you want to connect, how much do you want the reader to connect, and all of that. So. Sorry, you said first person was the most impactful. I would say it's hardest to pull off, but No, it's the, it's, it's, the most, it's the most impactful to the reader no. because the reader is acting it out. Right, but I, I'm thinking that second person, if you can pull it off well, okay. is actually even more. But I see very few successful instances of second person working the uh all of the uh, uh, choose, choose your own, own adventure movie. novels but that so is I will throw really them up. yeah that they, is they're... really you're doing it <laughs> there's also the novel you uh which is uh, a whole novel written in second person 
Uh, yeah, second person is incredibly hard to pull off, uh, unless you're riding the choose your own adventure. And then yes, it's a great way of doing it because it is very much a conversation between author and reader. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, so now Dwayne suddenly wants the, to say something. Yeah, yeah, now suddenly we've got no. That's I think that's Mark. It was oh, the right. other my one of my other boss cats. Yep. Coming in to talk in. But still with me because I am still playing with cats. Yes. <laughs> so going back, to, so continuing on with that. We all we all sit in here and write science fiction. Ray Bradbury and I was, I've been on the side while everyone else is talking, drastically Googling a quote that he's quoted by Ray, by, not Ray Bradbury himself quoting himself, by <laughs> Gene Roddenberry quoting Ray Bradbury. And I know the recording If you of can this, fit Isaac Asimov in there, you're like set for like heavenly sci-fi-ness. <laughs> well, okay, 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 let me pause you. Let me pause you on this. The second disc or a re record in the day uh, that came with the release of the Star the motion Trek picture. motion picture has this quote, and I'm going to paraphrase the quote because I, I cannot promise on my audience, our audience, that the quote is exact. It is correct in the spirit. However, since you won't demand Isaac Asimov, <laughs> Asimov he is on this recording. Yeah, okay. It's a great interview, too. It, it is a great interview. It talks about when Gene and Isaac first got together and met and um, Gene would basically told Isaac would he please shut up um, and I'll let you go find this recording and let you listen to it um, but he's, Ray Bradbury is quoted as saying something along the lines of science fiction is the last place where a philosopher is allowed to roam free <coughs> Would you agree with that? I mean, is there is there any other is there any other yeah, fiction I mean, that lets you absolutely. be able to play with different philosophy points and different things that are going on in the world? You want to be too. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just gonna throw out so uh, Star Trek being probably a great example of this uh, and all the crazy um, you know underlying you know things that they would talk about. Mm -hmm. um, However, uh, the Twilight Zone or Amazing mm -hmm. Stories, yes, uh, which is very clearly still in the science fiction fantasy you know trope mm -hmm. and genre there. So I'm not trying to get away from that, but uh, both of those shows uh, explored you know philosophy and you know other things like that on a, on many many levels. Uh, I'll never forget that I need to bring my glasses if I wear glasses uh, at the end of the world and several pair. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, so you don't break the one like exactly. Before. It was, was that Walter? Now. Was that um, Burgess Meredith or who was that in that episode? It might have been Burgess Meredith. I think was it, it Rod, was. Was it Rodney McDowell? Might have been Rod, I, 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 I don't think it was Rodney. I don't think I don't think it was him. I think it was Burgess. Yeah. But anyway, go ahead. You're you're up next. I I definitely agree that it is the prime area where a philosopher can definitely roam free. Um, but at the same time, every now and then, you'll find someone kind of reaching out to tell a story that takes place in present time mm -hmm. that shows potential for something happening and basically just trying to trying to um, bring in our main character and everything discovering what the possible direction that things can go in the beauty about science fiction is that that direction has already been taken by the time the story begins because that is that's the beauty of it you know you have you have uh, three astronauts landing on a planet and all of a sudden finding out that it's dominated by apes. You know, like that's, um, that is, that direction has been taken a long time ago, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you have, um, so science fiction, what the beauty of science fiction is, is it shows you the result of what can happen. Mm -hmm. While every now and then you'll get, you'll get a story that's in present time that will show the direction that it can go in if things continue to go along that course. You know, it's funny, you, you, you referenced the original movie series there, uh, Planet of the Apes. Apes. I've read the actual book Pierre, by mm -hmm. Pierre Boulet, which is really a short book. It, yeah. it, it's amazing to think this one little book kicked off 
an entire franchise of stories, um, both movies, television series, comic books, yep. and now movies again. And it helps if you have Rod Serling as one of the two screenwriters. Oh, and, yeah. And Michael G. Wilson, I believe, as the other one, yeah. who is somebody who dealt a lot with McCarthyism. Yeah. So the fact that you have those two minds coming together, using Pierre Boulle's novel as... As a as a source material, it couldn't help but just go. You well, know, and add in that Pierre Boyle's Pierre Boyle's, Boyle's um, used Darwin to create mm -hmm. the story. So you've got all those minds together. Yeah. Um, so real quick, sorry, just to jump in. Yeah, uh, you were right. It was Burgess Meredith in uh, the classic episode "Time Enough at Last" from 1959. Nice. That's what I thought. I, I, but oh. anyway. What I was going with this is, if you read the book, it ends a whole lot different than any of the movies. Um, spoiler alert, you know, <laughs> right, it's been out for how long? Mm -hmm. um, the astronaut and... Um, I can't think, I can't remember what, <laughs> what the act... I can't remember if the character's name's the same in the movies or what, as it was in the book, but anyway, the female role. They get back into the spaceship. They actually landed on a different planet. Mm -hmm. that's run by apes. And the whole entire story about humanity having devolved and all that stuff and the apes having evolved. He gets, in the, he gets back in the spaceship and they shoot back to Earth and guess what's happened back here. So, kicking this back off, now over to my wife. I know I'm on a huge sidetrack there, but go ahead. Yeah, um, back to what George was saying um, <laughs> earlier. You actually said more or less what I was going to say, but the thing about sci-fi... It lends itself. You can do it in other genres, but it's a little bit harder because yeah. at some point it becomes sci-fi. Basically, you can take something to its extre logical extreme. Mm -hmm. Like, if this philosophy were to actually be implemented in its pure form, what would happen? Mm -hmm. Some of it more realistically than others. Um, one author, um, it's again, sci-fi, all the intelligent people are all human descended people so there aren't intelligent aliens but they live in other planets but I can tell just like each planet she just had fun of like okay this is egalitarianism taken to the extreme mm -hmm. this one is what would actually happen if they really did have a planet that was basically libertarian philosophy to the extreme and yeah it sure looks like feudalism to me <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, you know so just well, if you take those philosophies, whatever, and she actually makes backstories that make sense for each of those founding why they evolved that way, mm -hmm. but the re results are very interesting, and you can explore them. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like how Frank Herbert did that with Dune. Mm -hmm. Okay, we were thinking yeah. on the same lines. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Dune. Yes, yes. I actually just Dune. watched Dune the other night too. Which version? Eighty-four. Hello. There's only one version. Yeah, oh, you mean a versions. version of the eighty-four version? No, no, no. There's two versions. Really? Well, there's. <laughs> okay. I will allow the other sci-fi one to exist because it was pretty cool, but there will forever just be Kyle McLaughlin going. Space. With all the like, you know, you got Sting, you got. Oh yeah. See, he and I are going to disagree on this. This is uh, why we sword fight all. The time. <laughs> uh, Anyway. There are better reasons to sword <laughs> fight other than David Lynch rules. No, it doesn't. <laughs> what I was going to say with Dune is, and I'm glad you brought it up, Dune is an interesting story in itself. Okay, what everybody has read, seen on movies and so forth, is the final version, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it came out of Frank Herbert's interest in Islam yeah. and the way Islam itself came about. What most people may not know, though it is published um, by Frank Herbert's son, co-writing with um, Kevin Anderson. Thank you. Kevin Anderson is the original version of Dune. And the original version of Dune, it was nothing to do with the philosophy of this religion. It dealt with the philosophy of drug cartels. And control, once again, controlling the spice. The spice was a drug. I would suggest finding it, reading it, or listening to an audiobook, and then doing Dune again. There's a lot of interconnection that still remained between them. But it's an interesting way in which the philosophy of what Frank Herbert was going for eventually came out differently than what is a much later draft of the, or a much earlier draft of this. 
Go ahead. Well, if you do, I mean, it's all about the, you know, like, the final version of Dune that we get is, you know, I mean, the, you know. The spice must flow? The spice, yeah, must, the spice flow. must flow. There, there's a whole philosophy that that's going on in that, uh -huh. you know, that, that runs actually several differences, which is kind of cool. But anyway, what my actual point was going to be uh, is about anime. Mm. Um, our Western anime, if you want to call it that, uh, does not necessarily do that. We consider it kids entertainment. Um, however, on the other side of the ocean, it is not necessarily always considered kids' entertainment. True. And anime can be an excellent way of exploring philosophy. Uh, my favorite is uh, Ghost in the Shell, um, the animes and stuff. Though the movie wasn't horrible, it just lacked the the philosophy that is in Ghost in the Shell. It lacked the ghost in the shell. Yeah, it, and the point is, and what they do is, is you know, a whole take on the traditional psyches and traditional beliefs and then mixing that in with a cyberpunk vibe and what's going on in the future and everything that kind of can go along with that. So there's a whole thing about, you know, existentialism to the point of what is consciousness, what is life, and all this kind of greatness. It's made the movie a classic. I mean, it came out 20, 30 years ago. Oh, I thought they just remade it. Yeah, they did just remake it, okay. but in the original, the original, the original one, yeah, was, the original uh, anime, which, which is, is like the only 80, one you want to watch. Which, oh, ninety five, I think. Is, is, is that the, okay? I can't remember the exact. Year I think it, it was ninety five. But the point is, is that it's still around. It's become a seminal movie. It's become one of the greatest animes out there. Right up there with Akira. Yeah, simply yeah. Akira is another one that explores, yeah. and the reason why I think these do so well is because you know, like we were saying, these aren't just stories. These aren't just a you know shoot 'em up action flick these have deep psychological meaning that goes into them there is huge undercurrents of you know philosophy and government and life and spirituality and what it means to be human and what it means to be alive and what it means to have a brain and be a person and all this kind of stuff that flows out of anime that i think is fascinating and there's some really great ones that break down a variety of things and it's that ability to explore um, one of the reasons why science fiction and fantasy, I think, are this bastion of being able to explore is because we work in universes that we create from the ground up. So if we want a society that reflects something that we're trying to show, it's very easy for us to do, whereas a detective novel is limited in the world in which it can show, and if it goes too crazy, it suddenly becomes a sci-fi detective novel or a fantasy detective novel and is switched, or a paranormal or something like that. I would say paranormal is probably where you're going to find the most, you know, kind of craziness. And then the other one, obviously, is literary. Uh, all literary novels consider themselves to be huge works of psychological and uh, existential and logic, you know, being broken down and showing the way that society and we break down, looking deep into ourselves. So I would say that's probably your other bastion for... Beyond science fiction, uh, would be literary. I have a hard time defining literary other than the they don't expect to sell a lot. <laughs> the, 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 the easiest, Ouch. as someone who used to publish literary, uh, the easiest way for me to describe it is uh, it is not a it is a it is a story about a person. I, I always like to call it the Seinfeld effect. They are books about nothing uh, because they're not. They're not about uh, you know kings and queens taking over anything. Uh, they can take place in an hour of time or weeks of time, mm -hmm. you know, but the, the whole point is that the story, the, the overall game plot is not what matters. It's the progression of the character through the book that matters. And that's probably the biggest definition for what is literary. I'm going to go with, um, back to the mysteries comment you made. Um, there is, with mysteries, has a great way of reviewing modern day culture as it exists and exploring the aspects of how modern day culture exists alongside of crime and whether or not justice can be served. <laughs> and what's, I'm going to use two examples, they're very classics, um, authors. One is Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie, while I love her works, I, I am saying that because I'm going to get critical here in a second, all of our characters move like chess pieces throughout the story as their social class exists. Now, to play fair, I'm going from one queen of crime to another queen of crime, the one inheriting 
Agatha Christie's title, who's also British, who I think has recently has passed away, unfortunately, but that is Phyllis Dorothy James, otherwise known as, by her pen name, P.D. James. Now, P.D. James, what she did was she wrote psychosocial mysteries. So while everybody still remained in their social classes and acted in their social classes, what we got to see through that was not only how does a crime affect them and in their society and change their, how their lives are going, but how does the intrusive investigation go into this as well? And then the cop, who is a poet at heart, actually, well, depending on which stories, I'm talking about the Adam Douglas. I'm not talking about the Unsuitable Job for a Woman series, which also was lovely, greatly done. I have one of my favorites. But Am Doug Leash is a poet who's a cop, or a cop who's a poet, take your pick. And you can see how this affects him, and how his investigation affects everybody else. And even though he's of a certain social class, how he's able to interact well above that social class and what happens. And I'm going to leave this there because I really don't want to ruin the series. But if you are an Agatha Christie fan and have never read P.D. James, I'm going to recommend it as the other side of the balancing weights. Go ahead, Brian. And what I'd really throw out, and I completely agree with what you just said there, because you are true, that uh, it is a good way of holding up a mirror to our current day society. But really what I would say detective and murder mysteries uh -huh. do is explore that dark <coughs> side of humanity. Yes. The killer's mentality the serial killer, all of that kind of stuff, because that is that is a huge dark place to go. If you think about Silence of the Lambs or any of those, there there is a huge undercurrent in those books of what it is to experience those dark feelings, what it is to have those dark feelings, what it is to act on those dark feelings. So I would give you that if you're looking for that kind of you know darkness, uh, or if you're looking into the human psyche. Uh, the, you know, thrillers and mysteries can be a great way to kind of tap into that. Mm -hmm. um, I would also, I mean, if we're looking at that, then then one could say that romance is good for the notion of, you know, looking at the philosophy of love and the different forms of love, <coughs> obsessions, you know, and all that kind of stuff that go into it. So I guess when you break it down... Each genre is tapping into a philosophy itself. Right. I think it's just that science fiction allows us to show such a great variety because of the way you're able to twist the worlds to do whatever you want. Go ahead and I'll come um, back to If you want to see a nice reflection of society, read old science fiction. Yeah. Read some science fiction that was uh, written yes. in the 70s or 80s. It's amazing how... It's funny because some of the things that were the most controversial about the science fiction when it was written, we don't bat an eye out, and some of the things that they wouldn't have bat an eye about just seem really odd. It's like, okay, all the nurses are women, and all the doctors are men, and they seem to have, okay, huh. I was reading one series, I forget what it was, and apparently they were published in magazines originally, and it's like, oh, this must have happened in the 60s, because they rewrote some things between episodes. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, they're married. That was a recon. Okay. You know, it's like, it's like, oh, yes, and this nurse suddenly became a doctor. Hmm, women's lib. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going along with that, too. Um, yeah, I'm going to stick in the mysteries for a while, too. That is the other side of my genre that I work with. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot, you know, Brad, you said it best when you said, when you said that it holds up mirrors. A mirror to society and it's a way of looking at society, and especially through the darker side. Mysteries have been known to be very controversial, or some of them have been, are showing that showing a side of society that people tend to try to shy away from and then eventually confront because there are some great stories out there and great storytellers on them. Let me I'm gonna throw two of them, two such authors out there. Modern day, Walter Mosley. Who has run the Easy series, Easy Rollins series? I'm sorry, Walter. I almost said Easy Rider. <laughs> that almost slipped off my tongue. Easy Rollins series, which takes place after World War II, as of a black man who um, he becomes basically a private detective in a world that is very much still segregated, especially and it's out in California, which is I think it's out in California, which just makes it interesting of the segregation. Um, 
we're going to leave that alone. He also wrote one of my favorite collections of short stories and a play based on it, which is The Tempest Tales, which is about a black man who gets murdered, by, who gets shot by the cops by accident. He was taken as a wrong person. They were after someone else. He dies. He goes to heaven. He's going to heaven. He's in a long line, gets to the gates, and they say, no, you're not allowed in here. And Tempest, who is the name, is the guy's name, says, well, basically, why not? And they said, no, based on everything we see here, you're supposed to go to hell. Well, Tempest not only said, hell no, he, not only did he say no, he said, oh, hell no. And in the long run, they thwart, they send him back to the earth, and the devil and the angels are fighting over him to get his degree to go to hell, and it's all about free will. Great series of stories, great play if you ever get to see it. Another example of how society, how showing the reflection of society and leading to changes is the entire Virgil Tibbs series written by John Ball back in the 60s. If you don't know the name Virgil Tibbs, you might know at least the first novel, which was turned into a movie played by Sidney Poitier and eventually turned into a TV show, which was very distant from what the novel was about. But that entire series all shared the same title, which is In the Heat of the Night. Really good, it was a really good read. Um, the very first one, In the Heat of the Night, is about a black detective who is found sitting in the segregated side on the rail, on railway, sorry, railway, railroad station waiting for, rail, for a train to come. And he's accused of being the prime suspect in a murder that just happened in the town. And it's of a sheriff and the all his police department who really they're not trained investigators. They're basically what you would expect a small town um, sheriff's department to be like. And it turns out that um, Virgil Tibbs is not only a police officer, he is a homicide detective out of LA who had me in the area trying to change trains. I'm going to leave the story itself alone. I'm going to leave the rest of the series alone because, yes, I can do spoilers beyond that. But the, the, the dichotomy is played out in, throughout the entire series of books and the movie itself. It's a reflection of a philosophy and also a reflection of the darker side of society. So those are a couple examples and showing how philosophy can be applied there. Go for it. Um, I just wanted to just throw out there that one of the one of the great things about philosophy is that it can be applied to things that, um, that it can be applied to stories and everything by the reader or the viewer uh -huh. instead of the author or screenwriter or director. Yes, and that is that is always a great thing. Like you see, you know, like you can see this. You know, movie in 1979. You remember what the sort of feeling there was in 1979 during a time of futility in this nation. Things are not things are not going well. They feel like, um, especially the middle class, feels like they have been left behind. And they come across this movie that takes a lot of uh, a, you know several characters that all feature elements of middle-class America, people that are just scraping by from paycheck to paycheck and everything, find themselves in a situation where they have to kind of rely on themselves mm -hmm. because the their employers, you know, the higher you know class and everything, has basically just sold them out as expendable. Mm -hmm. And basically just, you know, put them in a situation where they are not looked at as a priority anymore. And that's alien. Hmm. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Sorry. More things change, the more they say the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that is that is something that uh, that when Dan O'Bannon and Ron Chassette and everything came up with it, they wanted to simply make a horror film that was basically Dark Star, Dan O'Bannon's, you know, um, 1974 uh movie uh -huh. with John Carpenter just turned on its ear. It wasn't going to be a comedy, it was going to be a horror film. And that was what they had gone had gone by. You know, that was what they were thinking about doing. And they wound up creating something 
that went to so many different levels because so of Alien. Alien. Oh, Alien. Alien. Yeah. Original. Yeah. Yeah. Which the novelization of the movie was written by Alan Dean Foster. Yes. Um, going with that, I'm going to now jump back to my sci-fi side. Mm -hmm. um, another book, series actually, that really, and actually, it fits a lot today. When you really look at it, um, it was written originally by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. Sorry, sometimes I remember books better when I do their authors, so I'm looking those up. Um, that's Logan's Run, hmm. which was a TV, which was a movie made into a TV series. But the book, I'm going to tell everybody, you really need to read that. And watch the philosophy that's occurring in there. What happens, what's the difference in Logan's Run, the movie and, book, and TV series versus the book, is that, okay... Let me tell you what's the same first. The first thing about the same is the problem deals with it's dystopian, it is post apocalypse, something happened. And to in order to preserve the resources, people are automatically killed at a certain age. Well, now, they're, they're, they're they, they, sent up. they are sent up. If you re, if you really pay attention to the story. They're killed. They're given a yeah, false yeah, yeah. philosophy. No, no, no. But they're, they're given told. A, Everyone's told they're just sent to the surface. Yeah, there's... Well, no, there's... It, no, not in the Is books. it just sent to... And I, and I thought in the movie as well, but I could be wrong. Whereas, no, there, there's... It's supposedly if you survive the ascent, you'll continue to live and you'll be allowed to continue to be among the society. Um, but in the book... Now, in the book and the movie, both societies are being run by a computer. The location of the computer is different in the book than it is in the movie. The, the location of the book is somewhere inside of Mount Rushmore. Now, what's interesting, though, and where I'm going with this, is this society, which really nobody lives past age 21, has to explain history. And they actually have historical reenactments. And they make the... They, there's an actual reenactment, I think, of Gettysburg. It's definitely a civil war... American Civil War battle, in which all the soldiers are 14 and 15 years old, including General Lee and General Grant. <laughs> yes, they were that young when they fought, which we know is different, but they had to rewrite their history in order to fit their society, which once again seems to be apropos to modern day. Mm -hmm. So, old philosophies still exist today. I'm kind of, I've kind of taken us down a dark bend. So... Brad, Maloney, George, save everybody from this dark bed. I want I want to just uh, go ahead and let everyone um, pause this right now, go to Amazon and download The Road to Doom. That is the book that we mentioned Thank you. before. Thank that you. That is the one that, that has the earlier drafts of Dune and, um, and Dune Messiah, and it also has a lot of different notes and everything by Frank Herbert and... Um, you know, it's a it's a good collection of what made its way to uh, what would become the classic novel. And then go see the documentary about the 1970s version of Dune. The Yodorowsky's Dune, yeah. yes. Another great one. And Highly recommend that, Did that become what became a 1980s version? No, 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 no. No? no. Okay. I knew, no, no, I knew the, the 1970s version. Dune... Uh, would eventually go on to become aliens and a bunch of other stuff because that's Geiger worked on it and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. Dan O'Bannon was brought yeah. into, and that's where he met H.R. Geiger. And yeah, um, yeah, a whole lot of whole lot of science fiction really owes itself to that aborting project. Yeah, basically all of 1980s science fiction owes itself to this movie. Okay. But it never happened. But it never yeah. happened. But it is a glorious never happened. It's kind of like Terry Gilliam's. Uh, uh, Man of La Mancha. Uh, yeah, Man of La Mancha. That was yeah. it. Yeah. Don Quixote. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One th I've got a question for everybody. What is some of the philosophy that you see in your own stories? Mm. You want, I can go first. And I'm just going. I'm thinking of two. One I'm currently working on, and one I know that will be in the graphic thing. I'm debating if that third one is going to be applies to or not, but one is dealing with free will comes into play. The other part is a philosophy of 
I don't care what my setbacks are, I can overcome. So I'll go with George first or Brad, which one of you two want to fight over it? Go ahead. Okay. Um, for from parts unknown, mm -hmm. I saw that as I was going as I was going through it and realized that I needed to give it a complete tune up in 2011 when I looked at it and saw that I did not like it anymore and spent about over four years basically redoing it. That was where I realized that I had the opportunity to put in some of my own philosophy is that we are in danger of becoming a dystopia in progress, uh, which is basically um, which is basically going to lead us down this path to where we are from parts unknown, where this hybrid of professional wrestling and mixed martial arts has become the only game in town because all of the other sports have imploded upon themselves mainly because of the different directions that you know that they're taking with free agency and the kind of money that's that's going into them eventually they will unfortunately die out and this particular one that is subsidized by the US government is not only the only one standing but it's also become a tool of distraction by the US government so that way the people can be occupied with what is going on in the ring instead of what is actually happening in their daily lives. Good answer. Um, so for uh, the Iron Chronicles, I guess the easiest way of putting it is rich people sure are different. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's probably the most easiest way of doing it. And there's a bunch actually. So uh, one is um, having to deal with decisions about your future. Mm -hmm. and where you want to go versus uh, where other people see you going versus what you want versus what society pushes you towards versus um, choices you don't even get to make, i.e. Um, decisions that are made for you by other people. Um, so there, there's a whole running through that, and that's really about um, a young person finding their way in the world and trying to navigate beyond all these different crazinesses. Um, Beyond that, though, uh, there is a whole undercurrent of what it means to be in power and whether or not that is a positive or a negative. Do you wish to control and dominate other people, or do you wish to help and save other people? Um, and it's, it's an undercurrent that runs through all three books. It is fundamentally shown in the decision that Alexander has to make as to whether or not he is going to become one of the good guys or one of the bad guys, and that spans all three novels. So that's in, you know, all three books that this decision is is tearing at him and making him decide, and then in book three he'll actually end up making the decisions and having to deal with those, you know, the, the consequences of those decisions and stuff like that. So there's a lot that, that kind of goes through onto that. Um, I do a lot with knowing your own path versus... Uh, people dictating your path to you or having expectations for you and stuff like that. Uh, so myth versus reality, I guess, would be a good one. But um, other things that I've brought up, so uh, in like Doom Fly to the Majesty, uh, it really is about um, knowing about what you can pull off uh, and then kind of a philosophy of, you know, what you can and should do in any given situation and how you deal with you know, the failures that come towards you. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of that that goes through all my books. Um, I like to deal with rich people a lot. Um, so there's a whole philosophy of what it means to be rich. Uh, and the reason I do that is because a lot of people in this society believe that rich people are somehow superior to other people. And a lot of my books deal with the fact that rich people are in no way superior to other people. And in fact, it's the opposite often is when my books that it is the lowlier class person who is better person than the rich. So that, that's a common philosophy that runs through all my books and stories. Just real quick to correct, Brad, it's the doom flight of the majestic, not of the majesty. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I caught that. I'm like, I'm holding that for a second. That's an old title. That was the old title, so whoops, slipped there. By the way, you yeah. like to hold me to my certain certain little um, foobar, so yep, no. I get one. Finally. Yeah, like yeah. No, 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 that's, that's a slip. Yeah. That was the first, that was the original title. Okay. Yeah. Go for it. I was, okay, I was just thinking in the current book that I am very slowly working on, it's kind of the same, it's 
similar themes to what Brad's talking about, except um, it's more along the lines of uh, playing around with duty to basically du duty to the good of society and the good of your family versus following your own path, namely, you know, do you sacrifice your own happiness or how do you find the balance between what's good for you versus what's what are your duties to the greater good? Well, that's kind of funny. I, I, I'll go back to the one I'm currently working on, which I don't want to talk about too much because it's not finished on the grounds I don't want, in fact, I'm not going to give anything away, but I'm going to say if the character deals with um, his father's forced promise out of him versus the good of society. Mm. And I will say this, I'll go ahead and say it. The character, it's, a super, it's what you would call a superhero story, though it's really not, the guy has no superpowers, he's just really well trained. Like Batman, like Iron Man without the suit, you know. Green uh, arrow. Yeah, green arrow. Yeah, green arrow is a good example. Um, Sorry, he's my bad. That's fine. Nice I'm, to Batman. I'm really, I really like the new version of Arrow than I do the old Green Arrows. But anyway, there is nothing there. wrong with an arrow that has a punching, ba you know, <laughs> boxing glove on the front end of it. Unless you're trying it's to shoot such arrow. a thing. <laughs> um, Aerodynamically, <clears throat> I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> As an archer, anyway. Um. <laughs> The man who used to teach archery. Anyway, um, what I was saying back to this is the in the story the father dies in the first act, and he was a version. He was a fir, he was a version of this character, this hero, and he's trained his son in everything he needs to know. It's only error to pass it on to his grand to his children, and not take up the mantle. Of course, he doesn't have any children at this point. But the reason why his father didn't want him to take this up is this character is hearing impaired. And he, the father was always afraid that, you know, he would not be able to survive out there. And in this world of modern technology, being able not to hear everything going on around him, and how's he going to fight crime? I will leave at that alone. This gives you an idea, though. He has this entire... There's a part of the book which he has to make the decision do I do this, do I not and if I do do this what's the consequences? The Phantom. And I'll leave that alone. And at that point um, we are almost at the top so any final words? Not hearing anything I will go back to the Gene Roddenberry quote I mentioned. I am not going to re-butcher that quote so I'm going to say look it up um, find the recording. Once again that is of the Star Trek, the motion, uh, picture. motion picture, score, yeah. score soundtrack, and there's a second disc to that. Um, you can get it. I know it's on iTunes. It's called Inside Star Trek. Inside Star Trek, thank you. Yeah. And there's a lot of great um, interviews and other stuff going on in it. But in there, listen to Isaac Asimov, but also is this quote. Find it, explore your own philosophy and what you write. Have a great week writing. I am not going to talk about what's going coming up next week because our schedule's a little bit in flux. We're moving some things around. So tune in next week for an interesting topic in the writing industry. Thank you for listening. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.